Professor, I want to talk about the new federal gun law, the Safe, the Safe Communities Act. What does that law put into place and how does that square with Bruin? So before I even get into the what of the bill, I think the when of it is pretty remarkable because this Bruin decision dropped on a Thursday morning. And I think a lot of us thought, okay, the Senate is going to use this as a reason to, you know, take this bill back to reconsider. And, you know, we need to read this 135 page pages of opinions we just got from the Supreme Court. But instead, about 12 hours after the Supreme Court decision, the Senate passed this bill, which was has become now the first major federal gun regulation in 30 years. It all happened in a period of days. The president signed it into law on Saturday, uh, about 48 hours after the Supreme Court decision. So it was a whiplash moment for those of us who, uh, who, who study gun rights and regulation. Now, what the bill does, it's a, it's a wide variety of things. I think all pretty marginal changes to existing law. It doesn't create a lot more sort of federal criminal prohibitions. Most of it is support for things like mental health interventions, crisis interventions, what's sometimes known as community violence interruption, which is essentially like non-carceral approaches to preventing gun violence, like not just relying on police and prosecutors, but like trusted members of the community to try to intervene and, you know, lower, for example, um, disputes at a, you know, uh, in a neighborhood. And all of that, I think, is very promising, especially if it results in fewer people being sent to prison for, you know, for, for minor possession crimes. I think that's all great. It does also, and maybe this is the part that people will know the best, provide some federal financial support for states that have adopted red flag laws, technically extreme risk laws or extreme risk protection orders. And that could be very promising. It's sort of like a federal government and state government working together. It doesn't create a federal red flag law. It just provides support to states that are either adopting or considering adopting um, uh, those kinds of laws. So I don't think that, I'm sure portions of it will be challenged under the new uh, Bruin approach. Um, but as I see it, what the federal government did in that bill is, is somewhat to the side. And frankly, a lot of it's not even gun regulation. It's just, um, you know, support for violence prevention. Support for mental health. Exactly. Like if anything was going to be challenged under Bruin, would it be these red flag laws? Is that analogous to uh, not allowing guns for the mentally ill, or is it something new and unforeseen in history and thus not constitutional? In, in a way, they're absolutely unforeseen. And, uh, you know, and the reason for that is that you know, there's about 20 states have these laws now. All but a handful of them have been adopted in the last five years. They're really a post-Parkland development. So you can't track the earliest even proto-red flag law in current form was adopted in 1999. So this is not a long historical tradition in the way that Heller and Bruin described. But again, I think it just depends how you ask the question. Um, and here I'll invoke then-Judge Barrett, when she was on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, wrote a dissenting opinion in a case called Cantor, where she said, look, history and common sense are in agreement that dangerous groups can be disarmed, and the framing generation disarmed people they thought to be dangerous. And if you take that to be the historical principle, well, then extreme risk laws are just a way of identifying a group thought to be temporarily dangerous. After all, the way these laws work is they allow a judge to order the temporary deprivation of firearms from a person who presents an immediate risk of harm to themselves or others. In other words, they present a danger. Right. And so, you know, it's just a different way of asking the same question the framing generation would have asked. They would have had a different answer, but or even the most stringent form of originalism doesn't commit us to the same applications as the framers themselves would have done. Thank goodness, I think, from the perspective of an originalist or anyone else. So I, I would argue that red flag laws fall pretty squarely uh, within that tradition. It's just a different method of getting at the same principle that the founding generation, as then Judge Barrett put it, recognized. 